Hi everybody, my name is uh, Rowan Miller. I'm a program manager on the Entity Framework team here at Microsoft. In today's session, we're gonna be talking about Entity Framework. Just so that you know what to expect in this session, uh, this is gonna be a bit of a mix of content. Uh, some of it's gonna be more basic, like level 100. Some of it a little more at the advanced end of the spectrum, around level 300 or so. Mostly demos, I've got a few slides to start with, and then we're gonna spend as much time as we can writing code in VS. I'm gonna cover EF6 and EF7, and I'm also covering some stuff that you may have seen if you've watched other talks before, and then also some new things as well. So if we hit a section you feel like, oh, I've seen this before, don't stress, we're gonna to get to some new stuff pretty soon that you probably won't have seen before. I'm gonna encourage you to ask questions as we go. Uh, the session's kind of broken up into logical chunks, so I might not answer your questions straight away, but ask them, I'll pause at times and take questions, and anything I don't get to during the session, I'll jump on Jabber at the end and answer for you. Okay, so we're gonna start with looking at where we're at, so the releases that we've done, the releases that we're working on at the moment. We're then gonna jump into some demos and look at EF6 in action. We'll then talk about what the Entity Framework team is up to next, that'll be EF7. And then I've got some really exciting demos to show you EF7 at the end of the session. So let's talk about where we're at. Hopefully most of you have seen this slide or some resemblance of this slide in recent times. So EF used to be part of the .NET framework and it was strongly tied to the .NET framework and Visual Studio. Then for EF 4.1 through EF 5, we adopted this kind of hybrid model where the core parts of EF were in the .NET framework, but we were shipping the new parts out of band on NuGet. And then starting in EF 6 through our latest EF 6.1.1 release, We've been shipping completely out of band on NuGet. The tooling is shipped on Microsoft Download Center, and the latest versions of those are chained into each Visual Studio release. This is also the model we're gonna use for 6.1.2, which is the release we're working on at the moment, and then also for EF7, which is the next major release that we're working on. So I'm not gonna dig super much into what's in each of those releases. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm gonna give you a link, which will give you a page with a whole bunch of URLs you can hit, that has sessions that drill into each of these releases and the features that are in them and how to use them. So I'm just gonna summarize quickly what was in each release. So EF6 was our last major release. Lots of features, lots of bug fixes. We also put the infrastructure in place to allow us to ship everything out of band. And because that was our first open source release, we were allowed to take contributions from the community. So we actually had 23 contributions from you guys, which was awesome. Uh, some of them features, some of them bug fixes, some of them just general code cleanup. 6.1 has been out for a while now. This didn't have a lot of features in it, but it had some stuff that we tried to get into 6, but it just didn't fit in time. It was also the time that we tried to clear out our backlog and get a whole bunch of bugs fixed. So we got through 120 bugs from our backlog, which was great. And although it was a short release, the rate of contributions from the community really picked up and we had 17 total. And then EF 6.1.1 uh, was our patch release. We just wanted to fix high priority things on our backlog. So we had 57 bug fixes and small features. Some of those came from the community as well. All right, so that's enough of slides. Let's uh, jump out to Visual Studio and see some of this stuff in action. The first thing I'm gonna show you from EF 6 uh, was reverse engineer code first, which is actually something that we shipped in EF 6.1 you may have already seen this, but we're gonna look at a new capability in it as well, which is the ability to customize the code that is generated during the reverse engineer process. So let's jump to Visual Studio. We're gonna be working in an application that a company called Cycle Sales is building. Cycle Sales uh, manufactures bicycles and sells them. And I have an existing database of theirs on my SQL Express instance. This is pretty familiar. You will have seen something like this before. We have bikes, which is essentially products. We have customers and orders and order details. And then we also have some promotions, which are promotions they're running on their website at the moment. In Visual Studio, I've started building an ASP.NET MVC application. I've just stubbed out a little bit of code to save us some time, but essentially this is an empty MVC app. And so far I haven't done anything with Entity Framework. So we're gonna right click on the models folder and we're gonna add a new item in here. We're gonna select ADO.NET Entity Data Model. Give this thing a name. 
So before EF 6.1, we had these two options on the left, which is the ability to create a model that uses the EF designer. So boxes and lines, drag and drop. The next two options are new in EF 6.1, which is the ability to create a code first model, either have an empty one stubbed out for you or create one from a database. So we're going to go with that option. I'll fire up the connection wizard and we'll connect to my database on SQL Express. Oh, we're just having a bit of a lag here. Give us one second. While it's thinking about that one, I'll just swap to SQL Express and show you that there's some existing data in the database. So you see we have some existing bikes here. So we've just got three bikes in our catalog at the moment. Swap back to Visual Studio. Looks like something went a little bit wrong on this one. There we go. And we'll select the Cycle Sales database. Now, folks may have seen the ability to reverse engineer a code first model using the EF Power Tools. One of the things that was lacking was the ability to choose which tables you want in the model. But because we've now consolidated the wizards, you have all the capabilities you used to have when creating an EF Designer based model. Now, the tables in my database are plural, so bikes, customers, etc. I want my classes to be called bike and customer. So I'm going to leave the option checked to pluralize and singularize table and type names. So we'll click Finish. Entity Framework will go look at the shape of my database and scaffold out a code first model for me that maps to it. So you'll see it's scaffolded a derived DB context here for me. It's telling it to use a connection string that it put in the web.config file. We've got DB sets for all the types in my model. And it's also done some Fluent API configuration. This Fluent API is used when we can't do things with data annotations. So for example, the model number field on bike is set up to not support Unicode characters. Now I can't do that with data annotations, so I've had to use the Fluent API. If we go and look at one of the entities, let's look at bike, we're going to pick on that one a bit today. You'll see that we've just got a simple POCO entity here, and it's used data annotations to configure things like the primary key. So if this column had been called bike ID without the underscore, CodeFirst would pick that up by convention, so there'd be no need to add the key annotation. It would have been left off. But in our case, it doesn't follow the conventions, and so it's added in some annotations for us. OK, so that's great, but what if I don't like this code? I might be looking at this and thinking, well, my collection properties are being initialized with hash set. And if I scroll down and look at them, I'll see they're actually typed as iCollection. Now, that's a decent default, but maybe I'd prefer to work with lists. So let's look at changing the code that gets generated by the reverse engineer process to generate list instead of iCollection and hash set. So to do that, I'm going to go and add a NuGet package in. I'm just working with a local feed here to keep things faster and make sure the network doesn't bring the demos down. Uh, but these packages are available on NuGet.org. So I'll call out where things are available as I install them. So we're installing entity framework.codetemplates.csharp. And that has added a code templates uh, folder to my project. And we'll see here it's added in a T4 template. These are the templates that are used to generate the context and the entities that are added to my project. If we go look in the entity one, uh, if you're wondering about the syntax highlighting, I have the devart T4 uh, syntax highlighter editor installed. So that's why I have nice pretty highlighting on the T4 template. Uh, that's something you can get for free on Visual Studio Gallery. And if I look down through this, you can see we tried to keep the templates pretty simple. So you might have seen some T4 templates that Entity Framework has shipped in the past, and they've been very hard to understand, very hard to modify. We tried to keep these pretty simple, so you should be able to understand what to do in them. Uh, we'll see here the constructor for the class being generated. And then we see here the code that's generating the uh, initialization code for the actual collection. So we can just go change this to list. So the other thing I wanted to do is change the properties from being typed as iCollection to be typed as list. So that happens right down at the end of the template. You can see here a for each statement that goes over the navigation properties. And here's a bit of code that's writing it out. Now, unfortunately, this one's not as easy. I kind of intentionally picked this example because it, it shows somewhere we didn't do such a good job of these templates. This code thing I'm working on is a C-sharp code helper. And so the code that's actually generating the type 
is tucked away in the C-sharp code helper, which unfortunately is compiled into Entity Framework. And not only is it compiled into Entity Framework, we didn't make any of the methods virtual, so you can't derive from it and modify it. So I'm going to have to do a little bit more work here. So I'm going to pull out this code, and I'll just pull out the toolbox where I have some pre-written code. And I will drop that in. And so what we're saying here is, if the navigation is a collection property, and I'm checking that by checking the relationship multiplicity, then I'm writing some different code to go and generate a list. It's hard-coded to be list. If it's not, then I'm just going to go and run the same code that was in the template by default. So I'll just save the template. Now we're going to see another bit of a rough edge that we have at the moment. I want to re-scaffold this model from the database, but to do that I need to go and actually delete all the files that have been created before. Now we know this is a rough edge, it would be better to have the ability to update a code-first model from the database, um, but at the moment this is what we've got, we're going to improve it in the future. So we'll run back through the wizard again. We'll just select all the tables. And if we go look at the bike entity again, this time we'll see that the collection navigations are being initialized as a list. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see that the collection properties are also typed as a list now. All right, so let's close everything up. Let's get a little bit more complicated now. That one wasn't too hard. If we look at our entities, we'll see that they all follow the same convention for primary key names. It doesn't happen to match the code first convention that it's expecting, but it is consistent right throughout my model. I'll see that it's the type name followed by underscore followed by ID. So in EF6, we introduced the idea of code first conventions. So I have kind of stubbed out a convention here. So we're going to write our own custom convention. To do that, we inherit from convention. And add a constructor. And then in the constructor, I can write configuration that's going to apply to all the types or all the properties in my model. So I'm going to pick on the properties. But we want to filter down the set that we're interested in. So we only want properties where the name is equal to the name of the type it's declared on, plus underscore and ID. Once we've got those properties, we want to configure them to be the key. You'll notice this looks very similar to the Fluent API, but instead of, uh, instead of operating on a single entity or a single property, I'm kind of doing bulk configuration while I do this. So that's great. That's got my convention written. But now I need to get my model to use it. So what I could do is come into the cycle context and start editing the code in here. The problem with doing that is because we don't have good incremental update the code first model from the database yet, if I edit this file and then I choose to regenerate from the database, I'm going to lose my changes. So I could do some factoring so that I have a way to tuck that configuration away into a separate class. But better than that, this is pretty easy to do. Let's just go edit the code generation templates. So we'll go back to the templates. We'll go into the context one this time. I'm going to scroll down until we find the onModelCreating method, which is here. And then I'm just going to pull in a code snippet again. And what I'm saying is modelBuilder.conventions now I could call add here. I could add explicitly the my key convention one here. But better than that, I'm going to use a new method that was introduced in EF6 called add from assembly, which is going to add any conventions that EF finds in the assembly I give it. And I'm telling it to use the same assembly that my context is defined in. So this is neat. I'm editing the templates once, but in the future, I can just add extra conventions into my project and it will pick them up by default. The other cool thing about this is add from assembly isn't something the EF team implemented. It was actually a community contribution that we got. OK, so it's great we've got our convention in, but at the moment we're still going to generate the key annotation on our primary key properties. And that doesn't make any sense because the convention's going to do it for us. So I'm going to scroll down and we'll find the place where EF is generating. Let's just get a bit more room on the screen where EF is generating the actual properties. So you can see here I've got a for each statement over the properties on my entity. And then if I go down a little further, you see I have a for each over the configuration on them. 
So the templates get past a set of configuration that needs to be done for each property. We're going to add in a little bit of logic here, which I'll just pull in from the side. So I'm basically running a bit of code to work out whether this is a configuration that we should skip. And we're going to skip it if it's a key configuration. So this would be where it generates a key annotation. And the property name happens to conform to the type name that's going to be picked up by conventions. Then we'll just filter on that. So if we're not supposed to be skipping it, then like so. So if it's a key convention and the property has the right name, we'll just skip it altogether. Let's save that. We'll quickly run the reverse engineer process again. We'll select all of the tables. And we'll see it finishes. And this time if we go look at bike, we'll see that it no longer has the key annotation on it. And if we go and look at the context, uh, we'll see that we're adding all the conventions that it finds in my assembly, which is pretty cool. All right, just so you believe me that this works, I happened to add some code to this project before I just scaffolded out an MBC controller. This is a public facing website, so we don't want any edit, update, delete functionality. So we just have a bikes controller. It basically gives, the index method gives me kind of the customer facing catalog of bikes. And the details method, again, it gives me the, well, the details action gives me the customer facing details about a particular bike. I also happen to add in some views for bikes, just one for index and one for details. So we'll run our app quickly, just prove that everything's working end to end. Remember, we had uh, three bikes in the catalog in the database, so we'll see those same three bikes uh, displayed on the screen. They have interesting names for their bikes in this company, but uh, there's all our data coming back from the database. All right, so that was reverse engineer code first with custom code generation, and we looked at uh, custom conventions in there as well. For the next one, I want to just quickly cover testing with EF6. We've done this demo a few times in the past, uh, but things are improved a little bit. Uh, not actually in EF, but we added some not officially Microsoft supported, but there's some packages you can use now to make testing a little bit easier. So I'm going to drop back to Visual Studio. If we look at the bikes controller, we'll see that it has two constructors on it. One of them is an empty constructor, which is what ASP.NET is going to use, and it just creates an instance of my cycle context. But I have a second constructor here, which allows me to actually pass in an instance of the cycle controller or the cycle context that I want to use. So uh, let's go write a unit test for this. So I've got one stubbed out already. Test method here. So we're creating some test data. Now we want to create a mock context and set. So something that's going to look like a context and look like a set, but isn't actually going to connect to the database. Now, what I would normally have done in the past here, I would have created a mock of a DB set of bike, and then I would have had to write a whole bunch of code to wire up link and to wire up my test data and all that stuff. Fortunately, that gets a little bit easier these days. So I'm going to come over and add a NuGet package. Again, I'm working with my local feed here, but these are available on NuGet.org as well. EntityFramework.testing is a package with some helper classes to help uh, with some of the boilerplate code you would have to write to test with. And then any framework.testing.mock goes one step further and gives you a whole bunch of helper classes for working specifically with the mocking framework mock. So we'll install that one, which is also going to pull in any framework.testing. It's also going to pull in the mock framework. So now instead of a mock, I can create this new type, which is a mock DB set of bike. Now mock DB set gives me some interesting methods here. Oh, I guess we need the new keyword there as well. So I can set up some seed data based on test data. So test data is a list of existing bikes. So I can set my fake DB setup to have that test data in it. And then I can also say set up link, which is going to do all the wire up that needs to be done for mock to basically mimic a link provider, uh, iterating over that list of bikes that I provided. 
And then we want to create a mock context as well. So the context doesn't really have any EF specific functionality that we're going to be using in this example. So I'm just going to mock it directly. And we're going to set up the bikes property, which is the DB set, to return my mock set that we created. And then all we need to do is pass that in to the controller when we create it. So we create the controller, we call the index action, and then we want to go and check that the most expensive bike is at the top. So this is our marketing strategy. We want to make sure the most expensive bike pops to the top of the page uh, so that our customers are most tempted to buy that one. So let's run our test. We'll go to Test Explorer and we'll see that it's actually failing at the moment. That's expected. We expected the most expensive at the top, but we actually got the least expensive. So let's go and look at the index action. We'll see it is in fact ordering by the retail value, but it's ordering ascending. So let's swap it to be descending. Go back and rerun our test. And this time everything passes. Uh, just a note to the folks moderating the questions, it's actually disappeared off the screen. So if you're able to hear me and you can pop the questions back up on the screen, perfect, thank you. I'll get to the questions in a second. All right, so kind of remember the code we wrote here because we're actually going to look at how much easier it is to write testing code with EF7. So this code is better than it used to be, but we think we can still do quite a bit better. All right. So that was our demos with EF6. I'm going to pause for a second and just answer a couple of the questions that are on the screen. And uh, then we'll jump into EF7. So the first question is, will EF7 also support Windows Store apps, Xamarin iOS, and Xamarin Android? So that's a good segue, because we're about to talk about EF7. Yeah, our plan with EF7 is to have it run on all the modern platforms that people want to target. So I'm actually going to. Uh, demo it running on a uh, universal app, which will be Windows Store and Windows Phone. And yeah, it'll be cross-platform as well. Much the same as Dan covered in the last talk, not all the components are going to work everywhere. So you may have a data provider that's not going to work on your Mac, for example. You know, it might be something that's specifically tied to Windows. Uh, for example, the ETW event tracing component that plugs into logging, that's going to be specific to Windows. But the core of Entity Framework will be completely cross-platform. And then the other question I've got on the screen at the moment is, will EF support column encry encryption like in Hibernate does? That's actually a good question. It's something we haven't really dug into that much with EF7. But with EF7, we are going to be much more lax about our constraints on the model and allow you to do better data coercion as it comes to and from the database. So it's actually a good point. Encryption is definitely a scenario we should make sure is easy to do with that kind of type conversion logic. All right. So Let's dig into EF7. So we kind of touched on the platform idea. So EF6 at the moment, it only works when you're running the full .NET framework on Windows. So this is ASP.NET, uh, traditional desktop applications like WinForms, WPF, stuff like that. It also only supports relational databases. Some of the concepts in EF are extremely tied to relational, and that is baked right throughout the implementation. In EF7, we want to open things up a bit. So we're talking about targeting new platforms. So this includes phone, store, It'll be ASP.NET vNext and the cloud-optimized .NET framework that Dan mentioned in, his, in the previous session to this one. We also want to target new data stores, so think non-relational. Don't freak out when you hear that. We're not trying to build some magic framework that abstracts away the database you're targeting. Uh, we'll actually talk about this a bit more, and then we'll see a demo of what that means in the real world. So all that stuff for EF7 sounds great, but it forces us to take a realistic look at our code base. So some of the issues we have, the EF code base is old. It's like 15, 20 years old bits of it. It extensively uses APIs that are not available on all of these new platforms we're talking about. You know, phone, store, cloud-optimized.net, they don't have all of the APIs that we were using 20 years ago. We also have a whole bunch of seldom or never used features that are strewn right throughout the EF code base. So these are things, we have capabilities in the runtime or bits of the runtime that don't work with the rest of the runtime, or you can't use them from either the EF designer or code first. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Now the problem is the EF code base is very monolithic. It's implemented, think like a big plate of spaghetti. It's not neatly factored. So that makes it really hard. If you want to go and tease out one of those spaghettis, you end up breaking everything else as you try and pull it out. In addition to that, we also have some unintuitive behaviors in the stack. 
Uh, a good example of this, if you're a, a web developer and you deal with disconnecting entities, so you retrieve them with one context, you send them across the wire, they come back and you want to reattach them to EF to play those changes to the database. At the moment, that's really hard to do because EF has some really weird graph behavior where if you say, one of my entities is added, it says, well, I'm just going to assume that everything I can reach from that entity is added. That is something we would like to change, but it's basically near on impossible in our current code base. The code base also isn't optimized uh, for running with little memory. Now, this is important as we look at devices like the phone, where memory is no, you know, it's not in abundance. It's also really important as we move to cloud computing. Now, I'm calling out memory here, but it actually also applies to CPU cycles as well. In cloud computing, how much memory I use and how many CPU cycles I use actually directly affects how much I pay to host my services. So these things are really important. And then as I mentioned, EF in itself has a lot of concepts that would be applicable to any database or any data store, not just relational ones. But the relational concepts are baked right throughout Entity Framework. So EF7 is going to be a lightweight, extensible version of EF. We're just going to pull for the stuff that people actually use. And we're going to build it and use common design patterns, like uh, you know, neatly factoring things, making it friendly with dependency injection. We've been doing some of that stuff in EF 4.1 through EF 6. But we want to really take those concepts that you guys are finding useful and apply them to the entire code base. We're also just pulling forward the DB context API. Now, this doesn't mean that the stuff you used to do via object context will no longer be available. It just means our primary API is going to be DB context. And then the things that you used to do with object context, like looking at the metadata we had, you will now do using different components. We're also just pulling forward code based modeling. Now, when I've talked about this in the past, I've said we're just pulling forward code first. And that kind of freaks people out, because they're like, well, I don't always get to start with my model and have my database generated for me. So I've used the word code based modeling here. Code based modeling, like we just saw in the demo before, I can start with an existing database and create a code based model from it. Now, granted, we need better tooling for that, for code based modeling to be the way to go. But you know, we're just really retiring the idea of having a single gigantic XML file with your whole model represented in it. Now, when you hear code based modeling, that doesn't also preclude having a designer. The designer happens to, at the moment, be based over an XML file, but there's no reason a designer couldn't be based over code based modeling as well, especially with things like Roslyn, scenarios like that get pretty interesting. Now, I'm not promising that that's going to be there at EF7, but these are the kind of things we're talking about. Now, lightweight and extensible, we're still talking about a full ORM. I'm not talking about a micro ORM. There are plenty of good micro ORMs out there. There's no need for us to go build another one. We're still talking about something that does link and change tracking and unit of work. And then we're also talking about relational and non-relational stores. So I mentioned we're not talking about something magic that hides the fact that you're targeting a key value store or a relational database. What we're talking about is the high level services that make sense for all data stores, like coordinating a unit of work, like providing the ability to query with link. We're going to pull that stuff out and make it general. And then the components that only relate to relational, like, for example, configuring cascade delete on a foreign key constraint, or saying that this property maps to this column in this table, that stuff will be extension methods that come in when you install the relational provider. So quickly, some common design principles we're trying to follow. We want to keep it looking like EF6 as much as possible, unless we have a good reason not to. So what we're trying explicitly not to do is build something completely new. This is still going to be EF, as in it will have the same patterns, it will have the same experience. It's just going to be built in a more modern and lightweight way. Paper play means if you don't use something, you don't pay for it, as in you don't have to learn about it. The assemblies don't necessarily even get loaded. There's no memory or CPU overhead for the features that you don't use. Extensible. So we'll have DB context. It will be built over the top of some nice kind of single responsibility building blocks. And those building blocks are extensible. So if you don't like one, you can pull it out and replace it with your own. Or if you don't like a little bit of one of them, you can derive from it, override some virtual methods to change its behavior, and then plug that in. And of course, you might not be wanting to use a full ORM, but you might want some of the functionality that EF has. So because they're building blocks, you can take the components we've written and use them in your application or framework yourself. 
And then finally, people have told us that Code First had a little bit too much magic in it. So in this release, we're looking at toning the magic down a bit. All right, so quickly before we jump into some demos, the question is always going to be, what about EF6 apps? I'm on EF6. This sounds scary. Please reassure me. So you don't have to upgrade straight away. We know EF7. We're going to make the upgrade as easy as possible. But it is also going to be a little bit of code changes required to get there. And in some cases, if you're using complicated features, those code changes might be a little more extensive. So EF6 is totally still supported. This is true with all our current releases too. We still support EF5, even though EF6 is out. We're going to continue updates to EF6. And they will go probably longer than they used to in the past. So uh, just because we know it's a bit of a jump, it's going to take people a while to get there. So we'll keep updating EF6. Just as proof of that, uh, the tail end of EF6.1, all of EF611, and we're now working on EF612, they've all happened in parallel with the EF7 effort. We also know not everybody is going to be able to swap to EF7 straight away, because you might be using some features that aren't, that aren't available in EF7 yet that are coming from EF6. It might take us a while to get EF7 to have everything that people needed. So some people aren't going to be able to move straight away. We know that. And like I said, upgrade's a key scenario. We want to have the same concepts, the same patterns. If you're just using the DB Context API, the code changes should be smaller, uh, pretty minimal, actually. You'll see that when I start writing. It's going to look exactly the same. If you're dropping down to, say, Object Context to use our metadata model, you probably know the metadata model in EF6 is extremely complicated. It's not a very well-designed API. So that's going to be simpler in EF7, but that means there'll be some code changes required. And then EF7, of course, is open source. We're on GitHub along with the ASP.NET projects. Uh, we have a wiki available. I'll give you some more links at the end to get started. All right, so before we jump into demos, I'm just going to answer some questions we've got. So have memory improvements been made between EF5 and EF6 for model caching? Uh, the answer to that is yes. We're always making improvements on the way we discover and load up models. We didn't make any significant improvements, I don't think, in terms of the amount of memory we use. There were definitely some improvements in terms of speed taken. We actually have a neat white paper that's up. If you go msdn.com slash data slash EF, go to the documentation tab, and you'll see a performance considerations paper there that talks about all the improvements and the difference in characteristics between the different versions of Entity Framework. Will EF support private setters? It actually already does today. If you have a public getter and a private setter on your property, EF will happily map to that now. May I ask about the best way to insert a bunch of data using EF? So it depends what you mean by a bunch of data. If you're doing like a bulk data upload, like we're talking about thousands and thousands of rows from a flat XML file, the best way to do that is probably not to use Entity Framework. Loading that data into objects and then inserting it into a database you know, it's just not the kind of thing that an ORM is best suited for. So I would recommend from your context, you can say context.database.connection, and it will give you a connection to the underlying database. And I would actually use raw ADO.NET to get the best performance to get a whole bunch of data into a database. May I ask about the best way? Oh, sorry, I got that one. C is asking, is migration from EF6 to EF7 going to be very complicated? I would say if you're using the DB Context API and you're using code-based modeling today, the transition is going to be pretty smooth for you. If you're using an XML model, you're going to need to do a little bit of work to get that cut across to a code-based model. Thinking we'll probably do something to help you out with some tooling. We don't have definite plans around that, but some kind of conversion wizard would be not too complicated to write. If you're using advanced features on EF6 from the object context, like, say, looking at the metadata model or you know, doing something more complicated where you can't just do it from DB Context API, and then there's going to be some more code changes required there. And like I said, we totally expect that that means not everyone's going to update to EF7 immediately. All right, let's jump in and look at some code. So I'm going to do the Shiny demo first. This is going to be the new EF, EF7, in new places. So we're looking at Windows Phone and SQLite. If you've seen this before, this demo is just going to be, going to be pretty short. I've got a cool new app to show you. Um, but we'll get through this one quickly, and we'll look at EF in some more EF7 in some more advanced scenarios. So let's swap back to Visual Studio. Now, Cycle Sales wants to get into the mobile space, and they want to do some advertising for users of mobile phones. Now, one approach they looked at was creating an app where folks could browse their catalog on the phone, but they decided that perhaps wasn't the best way to reach people. 
So they actually came up with a game. They've built this thing called Unicorn Clicker, which I'm just going to show you at the moment. We'll play it. It gives us a countdown. And then we have five seconds to click the unicorn as many times as we can. And then we'll see at the end, they give us a nice little bit of advertising, suggesting that we go and buy a bike instead of clicking the unicorn countlessly. The other piece of functionality on this app is it keeps track of your high scores over time. So if we go back and look at the top scores, you'll see that I actually played this before when I just fired up my laptop. And then, so we got 1.8 clicks per second on that one. And beforehand, and I'm sorry, before I got 1.8, this time we got 2.4. So I must be getting better at this. The problem is the data for top scores is volatile at the moment. So to demonstrate that, I'm just going to redeploy from Visual Studio. Let's just make sure the app reboots and everything. And if we go look at top scores, you'll see the data is missing. If we drop down to the app in Visual Studio, you'll see this is a universal application. So I have a Windows Store part, and I have a Windows Phone. I'm just concentrating on Windows Phone at the moment. And the functionality to store high scores and to retrieve them is all handled in the shared part of the universal app. So you'll see I have this game service here. And the reasons it's volatile is the data at the moment is just stored in a static list of games. If we look at game, we'll see it's just a simple POCO class that represents the game, the time it was played, how long it went for, how many clicks there were, and how many clicks per second the user achieved. What we'd like to do is be able to store this in SQLite. So I'm going to come to a Windows Phone app. We'll install a NuGet package. I'll just search by local feed for SQLite. You'll see entity framework.sqlite. So this is a SQLite provider for entity framework for EF7. Now one thing I want to call out, you can't do this using our nightly feed at the moment. You'll notice over here that the version number is T-1406. That's because I'm working with a private internal build we had. The reason for this is that some of our dependencies aren't yet updated to support the Windows Phone 8.1 platform. So we'll have that enabled real soon in our nightly builds. But for the moment, you'll just have to watch my video to prove that it works. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have it checked into our open source code base, and you'll be able to try it out for yourself. So let's install this package. Now, installing the SQLite provider for Entity Framework 7 also happened to install Entity Framework 7 into my app. So we got that kind of by default. Let's go add a class. We'll add a context. Now, we don't have an existing database we're mapping to, so uh, we're going to be using code first, creating the database for us. This is going to inherit from DB context. We're going to expose a DB set of bikes. So this should all be of uh, game, sorry. This should all be feeling very familiar at this stage, very like EF6. Now, one thing that's going to be a little bit different, I'm actually going to override an onconfiguring method. This allows me to configure my context, including which database I want to target. So I could say options dot use SQLite. Now, Use SQLite is an extension method that I get because I have the SQLite provider installed. If I didn't have the SQLite provider installed, I wouldn't have this extension method. All right, we'll just store that in a database called games.db. OK, and then the last thing I need to do, remember I said this database doesn't exist. We don't have migrations enabled on EF7 yet. We've got a lot of the groundwork done, but we don't have the actual commands working yet. So we're just going to use an API to create the database for us. So we'll create an instance of our game context on app start. We'll say database.ensure created. So this is a method I would normally use in kind of unit testing scenarios where I just want to spin up a database quickly. But for the moment, because we don't have migrations, we're just going to call it to create the database for us. Now, ensure created is an actual method in EF7 itself. Uh, because it, we feel like that's probably specific to most data stores, or it's applicable to most data stores. You know, this would make sense if I'm targeting Azure Table Storage. I can still make sure I have all the tables created for my model. If I want relational specific stuff, I can say db.database.asRelational. And that will give me access to things like the DB connection, et cetera, for this particular database. Now, asRelational, again, is an extension method. And I get that because I have the entity framework.relational package installed. 
that's a dependency on SQL Lite. So we kind of abstract all out the common relational concepts, and then the relational providers will kind of build on top of that with the provider-specific things that they have. So that's just an example of how we're not trying to hide the fact that you're targeting a relational database. It's just not baked into the core of EF. All right, let's run our app and see what happens. It's just deploying to the phone. It will load back up. We're going to go play a game quickly. See if I can get a better score this time. I think we've got to beat 12, right? Nice. Go all right, 14. We go look at the top scores. Great. Just to prove that it works, let's redeploy the app. Make sure we, the app spins and we get a new instance of it. But hopefully the data is no longer volatile. And if we look at the top scores, oh, we missed a bit. We created a context. We didn't actually use it anyway. So let's go to the game service. This is the bit that actually does the uh, saving and fetching of the game. So I'm going to say var to b equal to new game context. So we're going to add the game again. This should be all feeling very familiar because this is exactly the same as it is in EF6. We'll call save changes there. And then when we want to get it back from the database, we'll use our context again. And instead of selecting running a link query on the static in-memory list, this time we'll run it against the DB set, db.games. So I'm still using the same link query. Let's run again. See our app spin up. We'll play it quickly. Nice one. Go. And this time our top scores are being written out to SQLite for us. All right, in the interest of time, I'm not going to redeploy the app to prove it, but you trust me, right? Okay. So we looked at cool new shiny stuff. Let's look at not so shiny stuff. Let's go look at WinForms. And we're going to look at how EF7 does client server query evaluation. We'll look at an in-memory data store, and we'll look at targeting Azure table storage. I'm going to move through this demo pretty quick because we're running a couple of minutes behind. So let's just uh, grab the internal app. Of course, their internal app doesn't look as fancy as any of the customer-facing stuff. So this has the ability to manage all their products. And then it also has the ability to calculate foreign prices. So if someone wants to buy a bike from a foreign country, we can punch in the, the conversion rate, and it will calculate the prices for us. If we go back to our code base, the calculation of prices is actually done through something called the price service. So if I look here, here's the core query that it's running. So it's saying, from the bikes in my context, this is in the EF7 context, targeting SQL Server. So it's targeting the same SQL database on SQL Express. Order by the bike ID and pull me out the bike name, the retail price, and then also the foreign price, which is done by calling this business logic method I have here, which multiplies it by the conversion rate and rounds to the nearest five cents. And also, if it ends up being a round dollar amount, it'll take off five cents to make the price look better. Now, this wouldn't have worked with EF6 because EF6 always insists on translating everything into SQL. And EF6 has no idea how to translate this business logic method into SQL. Let's run the profiler and see what EF7 is doing. So I'll pull up my app. We'll just run this trace. So I hit convert again. And we'll see the query that EF7 is writing. <clears throat> it's just selecting the bike ID, the name, and the retail value. It's ordering by ID, so EF is choosing which parts of the query to send to the database. But the business logic that it ran through to work out the, uh, the foreign price, all that stuff is just happening in memory. So this is an approach we're taking with EF7. You know, providers start, everything happens in memory, and then the provider gets to choose for that particular provider which bits of the query does it make sense to send to the database. All right, let's stop that now. We'll close that one down. Let's write a unit test quickly. So 
cycle sales context. This is the DB context targeting SQL Server. So you'll see I'm pulling the connection from the app.config file. And then I'm calling because I have the SQL Server provider installed, the use SQL Server extension method providing the connection. And I had to do a little bit of config here just to tell it the name of the table and which property is a primary key. So I'm going to modify this class a bit. So I'm going to add a constructor that takes in a flag saying whether to use an in-memory provider or not. So this is going to make unit testing a bit easier because instead of having to mock the context, I can just say, well, don't, don't target SQL Server, target an in-memory database. Now, one thing that's interesting with mocking, I have to be careful because a framework is never going to behave the same when it's mocked as it's going to when I hit an actual database. Because a database provider has behavior in it that's going to affect how EF responds. So with mocking, when I'm mocking, I need to be careful of that. The same is true, but to a much lesser extent when I use an in-memory provider. So it's still not going to be exactly the same as targeting SQL Server. So I should still run my integration tests that do actually target a real database. But it's going to be a lot closer than just mocking things. All right, so we need to switch on this flag. So let's just say if we're going to use in-memory. Now, I don't have an in-memory provider yet. You'll see I only have used SQL Server. So we'll go to our references. We'll install a new NuGet package, entity framework.inmemory. Now we have a use in-memory store, which is great. So now let's go down to some existing unit tests I've got here. So we're going to create an instance of our cycle sales context. This time we're going to pass in true so that it actually uses an in-memory provider. I'm going to add in some code to add some test data. So it's actually going to add it straight into the context and call save changes, which will get it pushed into the in-memory database. Now, the way in-memory works by default is the in-memory store is only applicable to this instance of the context, which is handy for unit tests because it means if I'm using multiple contexts and different tests, I know they're clean every time. But if I do want to have the same store shared between multiple contexts, there are ways to do that as well. So we want to create a new instance of the price service, passing in our context. We want to call the calculate foreign prices method. I'm just going to call two array just to get it into a nice easy state to verify things. I've said the exchange rate is two. And we'll then verify the results. All right, let's run our test. All right, and we'll see the test passes. It was super quick because we're not targeting an actual database. That's how easy it is to target in memory with EF7. Now, one thing I should quickly mention, if you don't like doing all this stuff in on configuring, and you would rather set up this stuff externally and just pass it in, there is actually a constructor on DB context which takes this DB context options. So if you're using dependency injection or something, you can wire all this stuff up externally and then pass it directly into your context rather than using on configuring. All right, I've got one more demo to get through quickly, so I'll chew through this one and then I'll answer some questions for you. So folks also want to be able to look up the warranty information on bikes. Now, warranty information could go in a relational database, but when it comes to warranties, I always want to look it up based on the model of the bike and the bike serial number. So that's a prime candidate for Azure table storage. So you'll see here I have a whole bunch of warranty information in an Azure table storage uh, store. So we want to pull this into our app and use it. So to do that, I'm going to pull in another provider. So this time we're going to pull in the Azure table storage one. We'll look in the warranty context. So I started implementing a context, but I haven't got as far as actually wiring it up to use Azure Table Storage. So I inherited from DB context. I got the warranty info DB set. Warranty info is just a simple POCO class here. And I just got a bike model number and a bike serial number. These are going to act as the row key and partition key, but they're not called row key and partition key. The other thing you'll notice is that Azure Table Storage requires a timestamp, but I don't have a timestamp property in my class. 
All right, so I've gone and got a connection from my app.config. So I happen to have already put the Azure Table Storage connection in my app.config. So now I'm just going to say options dot use Azure Table Storage. I think we just lost the screen. Let's just get it back quickly. All right, we're back up and running. So we're going to pass in the connection to use Azure Table Storage. Then the last thing I need to do is override the on model creating. This is where I put Fluent API configuration. And here I'm doing some configuration that is specific to the fact that I'm targeting Azure Table Storage. So this API is very early. This isn't what it's going to look like. This is way more verbose than what we'll expect you to write. But I need to tell Entity Framework that the key is made up of the model number and the serial number. And for Azure Table Storage, I need to tell it the partition key, the row key. And then I also need to tell it what property to use as a timestamp. Now remember, I don't have a timestamp property. And so I'm actually telling it to create a shadow property. So in EF7, we have the concept of a shadow property, which is a property that exists in the database, but it doesn't exist in your CLR type. So Entity Framework will use a separate bucket to store that in. All right. Now I've already wired up the form. If we go quickly look at the warranty form. I've already wired this up to use the warranty context. The important part is it runs a link query against Azure Table Storage. Uh, you'll note that I'm filtering on the row and partition key. That's going to get pushed down to the Azure Table Storage. So it'll be a really quick lookup on row and partition key in the database or data store. And if it comes back, that's great. I display it. If there isn't a matching one in the database, I create a new one and then just prompt the user that they'll need to enter details for this bike and serial number because it's the first time we've seen it. Let's run quickly. I happen to know some values of one that does exist in the data store, so we'll look that up. You can see the existing information is pulled from Azure Table Storage. Let's just punch in a number that doesn't exist in the database. So we can say, oh, this is a new bike, so we're talking to them on the phone. They bought this from Fred, has a two-year warranty on it, and they provided the receipt of their purchase, so we know they actually bought it on that date. I'll hit Save. Save button is just off the bottom of my screen. If we go to Azure Table Storage and we refresh, oops, I wanted to run the query again, not refresh. You can see the new row is inserted. So we're using Entity Framework with familiar patterns to talk to a non-relational data store. All right, so I'm going to leave these links up on the screen for you. These are useful places to go for EF. Don't worry about writing them all down. If you just go to the top link, which is bit.ly slash ef.net conf, capital E, capital F on the EF, capital C on the conf, bit.ly's case sensitive, unfortunately, then all these links and more are provided for you. So at that point, we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to answer some of your questions. Any chance to have link support for generating delete update statements? Uh, yeah, this is actually a really commonly requested feature. So this would be the ability to say, delete from bikes where, and instead of pulling all that data into memory and marking it as deleted, I would just go run a command that has a delete with a where clause tacked on it, kind of specified like you would in link for querying. So there is actually a, a project. It's not written by Microsoft, so it's not an official Microsoft supported one. But if you go to Codeplex, there's a project there uh, that will actually provide that support for you on top of Entity Framework. It is something we want to add. It's not critical because it's not in EF6 at the moment, and it's not right at the top of the backlog. It's not one of the things we're targeting to have there for the initial RTM of EF7. But that's exactly the type of feature that's going to be way, way, way easier for us to implement once we're on this new, much more extensible, lightweight code base. Next question. I saw the roadmap, but I think I missed the potential release date of EF7. Could you repeat that, please? So fortunately, with EF7, we're kind of a standalone component. So we kind of get to choose when we RTM. We're not tied to a Visual Studio release. We're not tied to a .NET release. That said, at this stage, we don't have exact release dates. We're kind of thinking early to mid next year. And I say that very tentatively. Normally, at Microsoft, we just zip our lips and we won't talk about release dates. I'm just being really honest with you. That's kind of when we're expecting that Entity Framework will probably reach RTM. Of course, stuff can change. You know, there might be features that we weren't planning on implementing that end up being super critical. And so that's going to push our release date out. You know, it could just take us longer than we're expecting. So 
please take that as a, I'm just being really honest with you and trying to give you an idea of what we're thinking about. Uh, it will also depend on other products and when they ship. You know, if somebody's going to ship a little bit later than that and we just want to snap to their release, we might do that as well. Do we have to wait for VS 2014 for EF7? Uh, no, you don't. Actually, so I was using EF7 there, the runtime on VS 2013. So I just used 2013 in all my demos there. Uh, I also wasn't in these particular demos targeting cloudoptimized.net or ASP.NET vNext. So EF7 kind of works everywhere. It definitely works with VS 2013. We got any other questions? Or if not, I will show our GitHub site quickly. So if you're interested in kind of contributing to EF7 and getting started, this is our GitHub site. It's github.com slash ASP.NET slash Entity Framework. You might be wondering why Entity Framework is under ASP.NET when technically EF works everywhere. Uh, that's just because that's who we work with. We're part of the ASP.NET organization. EF isn't tied to, .net, to ASP.NET. It works everywhere. But the other people inside this organization on GitHub are the people we work with every day. So that's just why we sit under ASP.NET on GitHub. If I go and look at the wiki here, I'll see a bunch of information to help you get started. So here's some information to get started with the nightly builds. So if you just want to go try this stuff out, go for it. Bear in mind that it's super, super early. The APIs change. The builds I used are two days old. APIs have changed already. Uh, also bear in mind, you're not going to be able to target Windows Phone uh, from the nightly builds either. That stuff will be coming soon. There's information there for getting and building the code. There's information there. We're starting doing design meeting notes. So as we discuss things internally, we'll post up some notes that say, hey, this is what we're thinking about for design. And then I'm just quickly going to click on the getting started with nightly builds. If I go there, you'll find we keep this list up to date with some of the key limitations you should be aware of when you're using it. And then there's also the ability, some getting started information when you're targeting traditional .NET applications or Windows Store slash phone. Obviously, phone doesn't work yet, but store does. And ASP.NET vNext. So some specific kind of tutorial walkthrough type things to get you up and running. All right, we're out of time. So thank you very much for watching. If you have other questions, I'm going to jump on the Jabba chat room in probably five to 10 minutes once I get back to my desk. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.